Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending our third info session on the Mansfield Fellowship Program. My name is Alexis Rose. I am the Associate Director of Programs at the Mansfield Foundation. Uh, I manage the Mansfield Fellowship Program, including uh, recruitment and selection of each of our classes. Um, we're currently recruiting for our 26th class of fellows, which is really exciting. Um, we, well, before I get into the details, maybe we'll just start with some introductions of um, our panelists today. Um, maybe we'll start with Ben and then we'll jump to Sarah and then we'll go to Michael. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Ben Self, I'm the Vice President of the Foundation and Director of the Mike Mansfield Fellowship Program. Uh, as Alexa said, we're recruiting our 26th class. It's so fabulous to be entering our second quarter century and we're delighted that you're interested in the program. We've got two of our star alumni. I think all of our alumni are wonderful. I just absolutely love this program. But two of our real stars here um, this afternoon to answer any questions you have specifically uh, about the experience, what it's like, um, and everything from the homestays and the placements to the family, to the logistics of re-entering your agency upon return. So there's a lot to think about. Uh, again, thanks for joining us and, and over to Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Watson. I'm an environmental engineer in the Region 9 office in San Francisco, California. And I was a member of the 22nd class of the Mansfield Fellows. Thank you, and Michael. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Mike Fletcher. I am uh, was a member of the 21st class right before Sarah. I'm from NASA at, at uh, one of the field centers at the Ames Research Center in the Silicon Valley in California. Um, and happy to you know tell you a little bit about my experiences later and as we go forward and answer questions. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll start before we delve into our different topics today. Um, I'll just introduce a little bit about the foundation. So the, the Mansfield Foundation is a mission-driven organization, um, and our goal is to build bridges across the Pacific. Um, our foundation was created in honor of Senator Mike Mansfield from Montana, who was the longest-serving Senate Majority Leader. Um, he was in the 1960s and 70s. Um, he was also the longest serving American ambassador to Japan. Um, so the Mansfield Fellowship Program honors his uh, work in Japan. Um, and we're, we're proud to be carrying on his name here at the Mansfield Foundation. Um, the fellowship itself, as we said, it's um, been going for 25 years now. Um, it was established by US Congress with the intention of creating a core of federal workers with expertise in US Japan, -Japan relations. Um, we are funded by the Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Um, the program itself is a year-long program. Um, and if you are attending this info session, you probably know that we're recruiting well in advance of departure this year. Um, that's for a number of reasons um, due to COVID-19. So um, our 25th class has been selected and they were set to um, arrive in Japan this previous July, but because of COVID, their stay was pushed back one year, which subsequently pushed back the 26th class an additional year. So the current class that we're recruiting for right now, um, applications are due this December, December 1st, um, and then you would depart for Japan July 1st, 2022. So we're recruiting far in advance um, and we're trying to see this as an opportunity because there is so much time. We're hoping that it will give the fellows a chance to um, improve their language skills before departure, um, to continue their research on Japanese culture, politics, economy, um, and kind of really spend this time in between the start of their fellowship, between selection and the start of the fellowship um, and deepening their understanding of the U.S.-Japan relationship. Um, the program itself, as I said, it's a year long program. It includes seven weeks of a homestay in Kanazawa. Um, and then that's also an intensive language training um, program. And then from there you move to Tokyo where you have a series of professional placements. Um, 
that are relevant to your home agency. Um, those are negotiated in advance um, along with our colleagues in the Tokyo office who help negotiate on your behalf. Um, while you're in Japan, you would get a stipend for the increased cost of living and housing. Um, if you have school age children, K through 12, you would get a dependent allowance. Um, and while you're there, as, if you're a detailee, meaning um, you're detailed from your home agency to be in Japan for the year, your salary would be continued to be paid by your home agency. Um, I put my email address over in the chat for any questions that don't get answered today, but otherwise feel free to use the Q&A feature um, to ask questions. You can ask them anonymously if you'd like. Um, and then at the end, we will have a Q&A session that you can ask specific questions. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started with the first topic. So let's start with Mike. Um, maybe you can kind of walk us through the application process and how it looked for you, um, how you made yourself stand out, um, any challenges that you experienced and so on. Okay, um, yeah, so I think from the standpoint of the application process in my case, uh, NASA had uh, not had a, uh, a fellow for uh, 20 years. They, they had a, a fellow in the first class and so nobody really understood the process and what we had to do to, to make it happen. And I, I think the first thing um, that I would suggest for, for most folks, and it was really true in my case, was uh, you need to secure uh, support for doing this uh, with your local supervisor and with your funder, uh, whoever is funding you. In my case, uh, I, was, I was somewhat fortunate uh, under my circumstances to be able to get the financial support and the management support for me to be able to go away for a year and have the agency continue to fund me. So I would um, not take that lightly and I would, I would take some time and, and really work that to ground as you go through the process. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big key point, I think. Um, I think if, as far as structuring your application and addressing the questions and providing the, uh, sort of the, 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 the basic content for your package, I would encourage you to reach back to the fellowship and uh, get in touch with uh, former fellows. Um, you know, I'm happy, others uh, I'm sure are happy as well to provide any kind of input guidance, read your plans, uh, coach you to a, cer a certain extent and, uh, and help you provide you some guidance. I didn't know anybody. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to get uh, in touch with somebody from Department of State and, and a person who had similar experiences that really helped me out. So, um, you know, take advantage of, of the folks who've gone through it before. Uh, I think you'll find most of the people are very helpful and, uh, and have a lot of good information that they can help with. As far as the plan itself in, in your application, um, your draft plan, which you'll put in your application, is, is really the key, the core of, of the process. And, uh, and you want to try and think a little bit about that. And, and I think that's where um, former fellows can really help you. Um, you know, in my case, I, I, again, I didn't have a whole lot of experience. There were a lot of different organizations that I thought I wanted to go to. And one of the basic questions you'll, you'll have to address is how long do you want to stay at each organization? Um, I had very short stays and I had uh, longer stays. Uh, I had a, a four week stay that was actually chopped up by my agency into two one week segments and one two week segment. And what I found was that was really too short uh, to do anything other than get a cup of coffee with folks and sort of get a high level understanding of the organization. Uh, those people, unfortunately, I had a, a good time, but I really didn't keep in touch with any of them. What I, I found was more valuable to me was uh, longer stays, uh, you know, sort of six to eight weeks minimum, um, and then longer, you know, longer stays beyond that. Uh, the more valuable, you know, the sort of ten weeks or, or so. Um, I, I've kept in contact with a lot of those folks. You get a real chance to sort of understand the organization. You know, a lot of organizations go on monthly cycles overall. And you go through a month, you get a chance to see. You go through two months, you get a chance to see a lot more. Um, and and it's you just develop a deeper sense for what uh, the organizations are. So I, th I think think about those things as as you go forward. 
Um, and keep in mind, you know, it's hard. You know, think about somebody coming in from outside your organization to sit with you and learn about your organization. Um, it's a pretty difficult situation for, for folks to, to be put into. So the longer you're there, the, the better I think you're, you're going to find that experience uh, to be. And then I, I guess the last thing I'll say as far as the application process is when you're thinking about your placements and, and what you'd like to do, I, I would highly recommend adding a, a one or a two week uh, segment with a diet member. Um, I, I was uh, placed with a couple of different diet members and those were some of the more rewarding uh, uh, you know, uh, activities, I guess, as assignments that I had still keep in contact with uh, the office a member that I, one of the office members that I was with. And, um, and I, I found that to be a very enjoyable and enlightening experience. So, so you know, overall, again, you know, I, I think the key is really making sure that you get the support, the financial commitment from the, the agency uh, that will allow you to go for a year. And, uh, and, and using the, you know, the resident expertise within the fellowship foundation office, as well as the previous fellows to help you with, uh, with your process, because it can be a little bit intimidating. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, I also just, you know, volunteer that if you have any questions about connecting to um, fellowship alumni, if you don't already have those connections, I would be happy to try and connect you. Um, you can always email me uh, if you have questions about the application process, if you need additional support or talking points on how to get your agency on board. Um, these are all the kinds of things that we can support you with as well at the foundation. Um, Sarah, do you want to go through your application process and kind of um, highlight some challenges? Sure. I'll start by echoing Mike's first point about securing support for doing the fellowship in the first place. For many, it can be the most difficult part of getting your application together, and it really takes time and groundwork to get that approval in many cases because of the large financial commitment of paying your salary to be gone for a year. So um, it's October 22nd right now. I think, Alexis, you said the applications are due December 1st. If you haven't started that process, start it today. <laughs> um, I took a couple months, I think, to focus on it. You know, I was having some conversations with uh, colleagues or friends about, oh, you know, thinking about whether, you know, it's such a big ask to, to ask to pay for your salary while you're gone. So I think we can get nervous about even asking the question, but if you never ask the question, you'll never get the answer. And the more time that you allow for that process, the more time that it has to work itself out. So I started with my direct supervisor um, and I was lucky that he was very interested in my professional development and really went to bat for me, but I still had to do a lot of groundwork with the division director to even educate them on what the fellowship program was in the first place. I work in a regional office at the EPA and not headquarters, so I think there's a little less uh, familiarity with the program in general. So. In, in a lot of cases, your management may have not even heard of the Mansfield Fellowship. So getting them on board is extremely key. Without it, you can't apply. So, um, and then when you're developing the application, I would recommend to focus on your existing strengths and, and experience. So for example, I had not studied Japanese language before and, you know, half an hour into like, Duolingo or Rosetta Stone Japanese, I figured out that I wasn't going to learn Japanese by the time the application was due. So, you know, focus on, on the application, the content of the application. Don't pretend to speak Japanese if you don't speak Japanese, definitely, because um, that will come back and get you. But um, so focus on your strengths and your experience and where do you want to go after this? So what I ended up doing in my application is picking, I think, about three major focus areas within the environmental regulatory fields. Uh, and so these were topics that I had experience on and topics that I wanted to go deeper on. So uh, environmental re remediation and environmental international development, um, having placements in international development offices or 
internationally focused groups within agencies will also help you if you're a Japanese language novice, because a lot of those documents will be in English, but I don't recommend doing that for the entirety of your plan. Um, because even if you're in a department that doesn't have a lot of documentation in English, you can still really learn a lot. Um, Google Translate is not perfect, but it sh sure can help. So <laughs> um, make sure that when you are developing a plan that you really allow yourself to have like this big, bold vision. So you know, start at like your biggest reach for the stars. This is what I want to work in. I want to be sitting in the, the G7 meeting or whatever, and then kind of fine tune it from there. And in your application, like let that big vision still be there. Um, and then you'll be able to discuss it in the interview with the panel. Uh, you know, they might have some reality checks for you say that this is a bit, <laughs> a bit too much, but I, in my opinion, it's better to be a bit too much than to just say, well, I just want to do, um, you know, I work on environmental cleanup, so I just want to work in the environmental cleanup departments in Japan. So that's not very, you know, it's not, there's not a vision associated with that. And so, but once you get through the process and if you're accepted as a Mansfield fellow, like have that flexibility to, to fine tune it even further because I think in my application, I probably had four rotations, but then at the end of the day, just because of, you know, a variety of reasons, I ended up with, um, I think 12 or 13 placements in 10 months. And I do agree with uh, Michael's point about uh, kind of the balance between how deep you wanna go and how many people you want to meet and connect with. So I think your language abilities also play into that. Uh, if you're in, in a department that's, that's all, you know, all, most of the time, all your meetings are going to be in, in Japanese. So that's a consideration. If you're, if you're not likely to get super strong in Japanese before the fellowship starts, then there's, there might be an upper limit of how long you want a placement to be. And maybe that limit, it depends, but maybe a, a month or, or two. Thank you. you. You touched on a couple points that I just want to emphasize. Um, one of them being that, yes, you don't have to speak Japanese before you go. Obviously, you know, it's great if you do, you'll be that much more prepared. But at the same time, um, Japanese novices can apply as well. Um, so language training, you know, is, is a part of the program. Um, the other piece I wanted to touch on um, that you mentioned um, is just who to go to at your agency for these approvals. So that's a question that I've been getting a lot recently is I have no idea who to talk to at my agency, you know, what do I do? So the answer is kind of, it depends. Um, it changes depending on which agency you're at. Um, you can always reach out to me and I can try to provide guidance, but for the most part, it's an internal policy. Um, if you were to reach out to me and if it's uh, an agency that we've worked with before, I could provide examples of who that um, fellow had contacted previously for authorization to apply. Um, or I could just try and provide any information that I have, but otherwise it's really going to be um, internal policy. Um, in general, it's going to be the kind of level of person who can make decisions about salary coverage and personnel coverage, um, as well as approving details of employees um, to go abroad. Um, the other thing before we move on from applications, I thought I should just maybe bullet out um, what the application entails since I'm not sure um, that everybody knows. So there is an online application form that again is due December 1st. Um, it includes a personal statement, um, your placement plan, and I want to emphasize that it's a placement plan. So it's a proposal. Um, and as our alumni mentioned, things change between the proposal and um, what placements you ultimately get. But I love the point about just reaching for the stars, um, you know, go big or go home. Um, the Agency authorization form is another key aspect that we've discussed, as well as um, three letters of re recommendation. Um, and Ben, can you remind me, the, the letters of recommendation, it's one needs to come from your 
direct supervisor. And then can you remind me of the other two? Um, one who knows your work at the agency well, and one who knows you personally. I, mm -hmm. I believe that you should definitely not just trust me, double check what the instructions are. <laughs> on the uh, website, and it's a wonderful website dedicated to the Mansfield Fellows Program. So mansfieldfellows.org, uh, go there, click through, open an application folder, uh, put in your email address and start an application. You, obviously you don't submit it until all the pieces are there, but it doesn't hurt to start. Um, and then you'll figure out uh, bit by bit. When you have particular questions that are um, not transparent, sometimes that happens, we're happy to address those. And that's a great point that you can start your application now. You can do it in pieces. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. So definitely check out the application now um, so that you can get started. When I started here at this job uh, six years ago, it was all still paper applications. There's no online application process. And you had to submit five copies uh, for the selection committee and us. And it was all had to be done in a big mail. Um, it's much easier than it was for the earlier classes since you can do it online. And as Alexis said, you can leave it and come back to it later. Um, so just save and come use the same machine when you come back to reopen it. I think it wants that, but otherwise, yeah, please do uh, start your applications. Especially too, because you'll input your recommenders information, their name and their contact info, and they'll get an email where they can then submit their recommendation. And you wanna be sure to give them plenty of time to you know, thoughtfully prepare their recommendation. Um, so let's move on from applications to your placements. We've already kind of discussed a little bit, but if you wanna kind of just go into more of the details um, of the placements that you had when you were in Japan, you know, maybe your best placement, your most challenging placement, um, and any tips that you have um, for the applicants. Maybe we'll start with Sarah this time. Sure, uh, like I mentioned before, I picked three, three to four major focus areas that I had some level of experience with and wanted to go deeper. Um, I would encourage you to not just think about whatever the sister agency is. So I come from EPA, the sister agency would be Ministry of the Environment in Japan, uh, but also think about other agencies that do your work within, a, um, that do environmental work. So I also, so I had um, a few different rotations at Ministry of the Environment. I also had a couple rotations at the Japan International Cooperation Agency uh, and I had one rotation in the environmental division at Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then something that I wasn't as open-minded to when I was doing the application, but something that I was really glad that I ended up doing is the national diet rotation, like Michael had mentioned. So I spent a week shadowing someone in the, the upper house of the national diet. So you're basically shadowing a senator for a week. Um, their offices have a lot fewer staff than they do in the U.S. So they really only have, she only had, I think, three support staff. So you're, you're really actually getting to spend the entire week with them and just kind of shadowing them. Sometimes they set up meetings for you. Um, that was, that placement really exceeded my expectations and it was something that wasn't on my radar when I applied. And another thing is the private companies. So if it's the same as when I applied, you were allowed to do up to one month at um, private companies as well. So I spent one week at Toyota, and I spent one week at Toshiba, both in their environmental departments. And that was a very interesting experience as well. Um, when you're coming up with your plan, it, this is also a, a great time to talk to alumni and kind of dig deeper on what what they enjoyed and what they didn't enjoy. Um, another, another thing that I was able to do is uh, take advantage of uh, being able to travel not only within Japan, but also abroad in a couple of my placements. So I was able to go to a big international conference in Cambodia when I was at the Ministry of the Environment. And I was able to go with uh, JICA to Sri Lanka for kind of like a, a ground uh, initial like 
meeting to, to see if they wanted to fund a certain project. And then we got to drive over the countryside and, and check in on other existing projects they had for, for composting and landfill sites that they were doing out there. So it's really, I mean, and you can, you can end up traveling as much or as little as you want. It's probably not going to be put in your placement plan, whether you want to travel or not. And that always depends on people's situation at home, if they have family responsibilities. Um, but that is, is something to consider that your, your allowance will allow you to, to travel and experience different areas of Japan. I also, I worked for a couple months with the, the technical team for the environmental cleanup at Fukush related to the Fukushima Daiichi accident. And that was, that was really a great experience. And then there, there's going to be parts of the experience that, that pop in that, that you wouldn't have even thought of. So for example, when I was in that rotation, there was an annual check-in meeting with the, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. So that they have with the Fukushima cleanup team every year. And so just, just be open-minded to things coming up as well, once you're kind of getting through this process and even throughout the year while you're there. I think that's a great uh, point that we love to touch on in these info sessions is the importance of flexibility and also just being aware that, you know, some of the things that come up that you don't expect is all part of the experience as well. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, challenging while also um, it, it's just an incredible experience. Um, Mike, why don't you go ahead talking about uh, your, your placements in Japan? Yeah, I, I'll, I want to um, add a little bit too on the point about flexibility. Um, I, I really want to emphasize that, um, you know, flexibility is important because things will change quite a bit. Sarah's plan, she mentioned changed, my plan changed uh, even when I got in country. So um, you may be disappointed because uh, you had a plan that you thought was rock solid and uh, the best thing, but uh, it got changed. Um, I will tell you that whatever happens will be the best experience, okay? So it doesn't matter what the change is, it'll be the best experience. Just enjoy it. Um, Japan is a country of rules, not so much like the United States. Um, and so flexibility is also key in dealing with the Japanese culture. So I would encourage you to just relax and enjoy it. Uh, so I, I think the points that uh, Alexis made and, and Sarah made are really, really valuable there and good ones. Um, with respect to my placement, I, I basically took the approach that I wanted to spend about a third of my time with ministry offices and policymakers, um, a third of my time with uh, JAXA, the research organizations. And I was, I was targeting space and aeronautics uh, a policy and strategy uh, within Japan. And then uh, roughly a third of my time was sort of other. Um, my most enjoyable time was with JAXA. JAXA uh, has a, a few offices, research centers, similar to what NASA's organized at. And the research centers are, are outside of Tokyo and they're a little bit more relaxed. When you get into the ministry offices, uh, it's a pretty stuffy environment. Um, it's a bit more structured, rigid. Um, you, you know, you're gonna be a commuter. Um, you better get used to, um, you know, uh, trains that are packed with people and all that sort of thing. Uh, if you haven't really experienced that before, it's, uh, it's all part of the experience. Um, Sarah mentioned trips. I think she had the advantage uh, a little bit better than I did in terms of taking an opportunity to, to travel. I did have those opportunities um, and I, I would encourage you to seek those out. Um, she also mentioned sort of working or looking outside of your, your sort of base interests and uh, expanding yourself a little bit. I'd encourage you to include that in your plan, in the application and, uh, and while you're in country. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was in the ministry offices was to ask to uh, go to a different department and get a meeting, just, you know, an introduction, you know, tell me what you do. I, I saw this in another bureau. I didn't really want a placement there, but could we arrange a meeting and could they give me an overview of what they do? Uh, I think that was a really valuable experience. I really enjoyed that. Uh, a lot of site visits locally, you know, very laboratories, for example, or other research organizations, uh, 
that, those kinds of things I think are really uh, great opportunities to take advantage of. And a lot of those are very easy to set up. And quite frankly, you know, they're, they're looking for things that they can do for you. And so I think if you ask and show interest in those things, you'll find that they're very, very interested in helping. Um, Sarah mentioned the private companies. I, I had planned to uh, try and go to Mitsubishi uh, Heavy for um, about four weeks. And, and they were really not interested in having a government official from the U.S. Um, sitting with them for four weeks. You may find that. And, you know, don't take offense to that or be upset by that. Um, but, uh, you know, do what you can and, and keep in mind that it's going to be easier on the staff and the foundation and, uh, and your host. Uh, if you tend to focus more on the, on the government offices and, uh, and be very judicious in your, your applications towards uh, private companies, I would say. Um, as far as challenges go, um, you know, the culture is different and, and you'll, you'll struggle with that at times. Um, again, flexibility and relax, enjoy and observe. And uh, you're a representative of your country there. And so you want to, you know, they'll be curious about you and how you work and what your office like is, life is like. And I, th I think, you know, um, sometimes that'll be a challenge. Uh, sometimes that'll be, uh, it'll be fun. Um, some offices, I went to one placement office where uh, they didn't have anything for me to do. So I, I would recommend that you show up with a plan for yourself. Um, in my case, we, were ha we had the advantage of being in Japan four years ago at this time. And so people asked me, what's the space policy going to look like under a Clinton presidency? Or what's the space policy going to look like under a Trump presidency? So I just did research and provided them with a report. Um, I would recommend that, and most places will do this, but at the end of your placement, plan on doing a presentation for the office, what you've learned or some topic that you've researched that is advantageous to them or of interest to them. You, you need some things to kind of keep yourself occupied and, and that can be a challenge in that environment. Um, so I think I think that's that's something that was I found that was somewhat of a of a challenge. But I I think when you you can't expect them to you just show up in their lap and them to really have everything worked out in a plan. Some places were better than others at at accommodating me, and some places, quite frankly, were you know they're pretty busy. Uh, I was in the um, I, I was I was in the um, cabinet office. And the cabinet office was in the middle of putting together a couple of, of new laws on space policy. And they didn't have a lot of time to bring me up to speed on what they were doing. Of course, it's all in Japanese. So it's a little bit of a challenge for them. So understand that as you go forward. Um, and and the, I guess the final thing I'll just say is um, engage socially. You know, the, the Japanese are famous for, for drinking parties. You know, they have uh, nomikais, kangeikais, and sobetsukais. And if you're not familiar with that, that's, that's you know, welcome parties. It's just a regular drinking party. It's a, it's a go farewell party. And, um, and when you go to those, you really get a chance to interact with your coworkers in a way that gives you the best insight, quite frankly, into how the organizations work and, and, and uh, what, you know, how the relationships really are. So I, I, you don't have to be a drinker to go to these, by the way, uh, but you, know, you really will learn a lot and they'll love to have you. So uh, I take advantage of those things. That's a really great tip and I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, I've heard that it's really important for the fellows to take initiative sometimes if they're in, in terms of getting invitations to these social gatherings? Has that been your experience? That's not been my experience. Um, I would say it, it is, I think, a good idea to be, uh, take the initiative to really uh, set up some of your work packages and kind of what you'll do in your offices. And, um, and I think, you know, you're gonna wanna bring some of your experiences to them and share with them. That's a big part of what we're doing, but, Socially, I found that they were pretty inviting all in all. Um, I mean, there are some guys who would like to go out in the office and you wouldn't necessarily get invited to that. But for the office parties, generally, you're, you're going to get an invite to go to those. Was that your experience too, Sarah? Yeah, that was definitely my experience. And 
um, for myself, having done, I did so many rotations. Um, there were, it's, it's sometimes it's not only like a welcome party at the beginning, a goodbye party at the end, but then they'll often invite you to the end of the year party, the beginning of the year party. Um, so it's really nice to be connected in that way. And you do learn a lot, like Michael said. Um, something that he said that I wanted to echo a bit is the idea of being able to take your own initiative. Um, I was lucky in that most of my placements, they, they had tasks they were interested in me doing. Um, but sometimes, you know, maybe they, they don't and you, you want to think of creative ways to offer your time to them. Um, so someone, a higher up, like a division director, someone might come up to you and ask you, you know, we're, we're interested in emissions trading in the US, can you do a presentation on that? And there's, you have to kind of overcome your knee jerk reaction to be like, well, that's not my area of expertise. And, you know, sit down and spend a week and research and put a presentation together, maybe even uh, get in touch with experts from your home agency and, you know, give them what they're asking for. I think it could be a pretty disappointing experience if you're too attached to that, you know, like big stars in the sky vision I, I mentioned earlier. So having, having a backup plan if they're not giving you work and, you know, maybe offering a few things that won't take a ton of their time uh, are great ideas and being open-minded that, you know, you've been chosen for this fellowship, so you are smart and capable. And so if they want you to, to, to make a presentation on something that's in your field, but not necessarily your expertise, um, that's okay. It can be a surface level presentation. And I was a fellow from summer 2017 to summer 2018. So one of the biggest questions I kept getting asked was about Trump's environmental policy, for example. And you, again, overcoming the knee jerk reaction to not, you know, not wanting to go there and being able to make an objective and academic presentation of what they want to hear can really serve you well because it was about halfway through my placements that someone at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs asked me to, to do this presentation. And then I ended up giving it at every, like the five placements I had after that because people were so interested. I think that's an important reminder that it's a knowledge exchange, right? Like you're going there to learn about the Japanese government, but you're also there to represent the US government. So mm -hmm. it goes both ways. Um, one other thing that I was reminded of while you both were speaking is at the end of your placements, um, you'll need to provide reports as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there that you'll be providing regular reports to the foundation on your experiences as well. Um, let's jump, it's about 340. So let's spend a couple minutes talking about your post fellowship experience at your home agencies. Um, and then we'll jump into questions at about 350. Um, let's start with Mike. Yeah, sure. So, um, a few points that come to mind, first of all, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to Japan having had a relationship with the Japanese professionally. Uh, in my uh, background. My background, well, I was a project manager before in aeronautics and uh, technical. I'm an engineer, scientist, researcher, whatever color you want to color me by, um, but not a lot of experience with Japanese specifically. So when I got over there about halfway through, I started thinking about re reintegration and what I would do when I came back because I didn't really have a landing spot. Um, so I would encourage you, if you're in that sort of situation where you don't have something that you're already doing with the Japanese that sort of this fosters or continues, that uh, you think about reintegration seriously, because you're going to come back and you're going to look around and everybody's going to say, huh, you've been gone for a year. I guess you had a good time. Uh, well, we've been working while you've been gone, having fun, you know. So th you'll, you'll find that getting back to your home office is, is like you're loaded with a lot of great experience that you're willing and ready to share. And people are like, you know, uh, we're kind of busy, you know, there, there's not a lot of interest. So there's a lot of onus on you to basically take your experience and 
uh, parlay that into something that really is valuable because you've put together a plan that was valuable for your agency based on your your thoughts and what you agree to with them. Um, and it may be a little bit of a challenge for you. I certainly found that it was quite frustrating. It's been quite frustrating. Now I've been back uh, three and a half years or thereabouts. Um, uh, you know, people in Japan, they rotate, uh, the bureaucrats rotate out. Most of the people that I worked with are not in the offices that I was in any longer. Um, so you really, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, um, take advantage of this opportunity when you get back. And you really need to continue to foster uh, those relationships uh, very aggressively. I, I keep in touch with a lot of the people that I worked with um, and, uh, and also my homestay family um, quite a bit. I've seen them a couple of times and gone over with my kids and uh, still talk to them and uh, see how they're doing. Uh, those, those things are, you know, are very helpful. And they're also very satisfying and rewarding. You'll, you'll like that. Uh, when I return to, uh, head, I, I support headquarters aeronautics and, um, and I, I had an opportunity to, to start out by working international partnerships and, and as a technical advisor. And, and that worked. And also at my center, I had the opportunity to provide um, sort of the expertise for partnerships. And, and that's been very rewarding for me. Um, I, I've, I've fostered a lot of uh, visits uh, from government and private uh, contacts that I've made, uh, you know, created more of a, a strategic relationship between the center specifically and, and have kind of really become looked at as the expert for Japan from the center's perspective. Uh, but that's, it's not really easy to do that, to say in my class, you now they've come back um, and unfortunately they really, you know, they've developed a lot of, of opportunity, personal growth and um, enlightenment through the program. Um, but not everybody's been able to take advantage of it. And, and it does take a lot of work, a lot of care and feeding, if you will, to kind of make that happen. and keep it going. Um, um, so uh, hopefully, Julie, you asked a question, I think, in the chat box. I think, I think that maybe this, this segment will address. So that I think. I think you're breaking up a little bit, Mike. Some internet instability oh. there. Sorry. Just I don't know where I broke up. I, I thought I was all done. Do you want me to try again? <laughs> it was just at the very end there. Okay. Well, I was just summing up. So over to Sarah. Sure. Um, I think you'll find uh, those of you who are listening who work in science or, or engineering focused agencies that there are a lot fewer positions that you could transfer back into which would have a direct connection to what you were doing during the fellowship. Um, so for example, at the EPA, there's, there's only one position in, in EPA headquarters uh, who's the person is basically like a, a Southeast Asia or an East Asia uh, desk officer. So they work directly with the Japanese government, the Korean, South Korean government and um, China, Hong Kong and Taiwan. So, um, unless that person vacates the position, you know, you don't really have a shot at it. So since the two years I've been back, that person is still in the position. So I think if they're, if you're, if you come from an agency more like state department or something like that, um, obviously, you know, there's, there's more opportunities to kind of hit the ground running or, or pick up where you left off. Um, when I was finishing my fellowship, I was also thinking about what would be next. Um, there is, um, you could uh, decide you're interested in applying for jobs. You know, you have to stay with the federal government for at least two years after. Um, that's a requirement. So it's, if you're it's interested in staying in Japan, there's the possibility of looking at uh, jobs on U.S. military bases in Japan. Uh, when I was getting back and applying for jobs, I, um, I had been offered a job at an agency 
one of the defense agencies in Germany. And, you know, I almost took that to keep the international thing going, but it just, I just decided that staying with EPA was the best for me at that time. So I think it's important to keep in mind that if, if there's no direct path or, you know, e even if there's a, a perfect position that you could slide back into, you're still going to have to compete for it. And it has to be open at the, the perfect time. So I think, you know, not getting too stressed out about sliding back into the perfect position is good. I think it's good to be open-minded. It's good to keep in mind your longer term career goals. Um, you know, this is about professional development at the end of the, of the day, as, as well as fortifying that US Japan relationship. So, uh, even though the position that I'm in currently doesn't work directly with Japan, I still keep in touch with a lot of the colleagues, um, a lot of the environmental cleanup stuff, there's, there's overlap. So, picking the people you want to keep in touch with and then being open-minded that even if the perfect opportunity doesn't follow the Mansfield Fellowship, there might be uh, additional opportunities in the future that you never would have otherwise if you hadn't done this fellowship. Thank you so and much. And I think um, Siri Hakala, who's on NOAA and one of the next panelists, she, she was able to go back into an international position as a scientist. So maybe if people are interested in hearing her perspective, she has more advice. That's a really good plug. Our next uh, info session is Tuesday, November 10th, if you did want to attend that one. Let me um, just say that, sorry uh, to speak over you. Um, many of our alumni find that coming back is the hardest part and they come back and they're um, back to their same old job and they wonder if it was all a dream. Um, and that can be rough. Reentry can be rough. But I know in many cases, they're able to eventually establish some forms of cooperation with Japanese counterpart agencies. And uh, I think of Catherine Lee at the FDA, who came back, uh, she's in pediatric drugs, um, didn't, there was no natural partnership with Japan for her function. And the jobs within FDA that did deal directly with Japan were filled. As Sarah said, those, there are already people in a lot of those positions. But she was able to develop something after about five years. You know, it took years after her fellowship of, you know, back and forth with her friends and contacts in Tokyo. But now they do a joint training between the FDA and the Japanese PMDA for pediatric drug approval processes for third countries in Southeast Asia. And so she's able to support that process so that those, you know, government officials from around the region come to Japan, she comes also, and, and they're doing partnership. And that's something she built. Um, I think that's a, a great example of how you can take your area of expertise, your partnership with Japan, and, and contribute to a better world uh, as this fellowship envisions. I know sometimes it's really frustrating and it does take years of plugging away at it. Um, but I've seen a number of cases where that has been successful, as well as sometimes, you know, people just luck into exactly the right position and end up taking on a Japan portfolio right away upon their return. Thank Thanks, you. Alexis. Yeah. Um, so let's jump into Q&A. We've only got about 10 minutes left, so we'll try and go through these really quickly. Um, Ben, maybe, do you want to actually take the lead on just um, questions that you haven't yet answered in the chat? I've been trying to keep up, but I'm not sure that I... We have, I'd like to go to the Q&A boxes. Um, and the first one was how uh, you were able to gain support from management. And I think that's also Julie, Kyung, is that Kyung, um, asking uh, how you were able to persuade them uh, that their support would be worthwhile. And it's a really critical question. Um, uh, I think you've sort of started to answer it, and I think it varies case by case so much. But are, are any tips, uh, Mike? Uh, you know, my situation I think was a little bit unusual because I was working directly for headquarters and uh, I had the support of one of the associate administrators. So um, that was a pretty, that was some high power there. I, I think that. You know, your local supervisors and the HR reps are the ones that you probably need to, to really engage with because uh, I did have a local HR rep who was extremely helpful in navigating the process and knew who to talk to 
and how to get that lined up and how to say it in a way that was really beneficial. So, uh, I mean, Sarah mentioned this too, but you know, it is a real, it is really hard to convince the agency to say, yeah, we'll pay for you to be gone for a year. You know, I mean, that's just the bottom line. So uh, trying to find the right advocacy and working that as soon as possible is, um, you know, it's, it's hard to look at because each one is different. Yeah, to echo uh, what Mike is saying, um, so find a, a champion. I mean, if you, maybe this isn't applicable to today, we're all working at home so much, but you know, if you go to the, the, the workplace gym with the regional administrator, bring it up. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it can be helpful to have the highest up person that you already know. And if they're on your side, then they can convince um, you know, your boss or the division director, whoever's kind of sticking their feet. I think another key piece is giving people time to process the request. So you can't expect to have a meeting with your boss or the division director or the regional administrator and have them say yes on the spot. You have to give people time because it is a big ask. So I think planting the seeds and, and waiting to see where it goes is, is really key. And do know that if it if it's a no this year, that doesn't mean it's a no forever. You know, I, I know the Mansfield Foundation really believes in this fellowship and they really want to keep it around forever. So yeah, keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, we also have a quick question. Do you have to present anything to your supervisors when you return? Can I address that one? Maybe jump in. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention this. Um, in addition to having a plan about reintegration, um, I would recommend that you build a briefing of your experience, your, your year there on what you've learned and what you propose or what you can bring back to the agency and then brief everybody that you can think of in your organization when you get back and basically say, this is, I want to share this with you. Uh, somebody recommended that in my organization and uh, for whatever reason, I latched onto that. And that turned out to be a really valuable experience and opportunity. So you're gathering information for your organization. And when you take that back, if you have a package, a presentation that you can put together, you know, and it, and, you know, I mean, it should be relevant to the organization, right? Not just pictures of you on the trail at, at on the top to Mount Fuji or something, but I mean, <laughs> you know, really good information about, hey, this is what this bureau and this ministry does and how we can work with them and that sort of thing. Yeah, I agree. It was not required uh, by any means. And I, I kind of had that same experience as Mike is people are like, oh, you're back. How was it? Oh, cool. <laughs> um, but I, I think people, the people who did choose to come and, and sit and listen to me talk about it for for 45 minutes or an hour and, and we had Q and A about it. I think they, they really enjoyed hearing about it. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I gave that presentation to anyone who would listen when I came back. Thank you. Um, ben, let's see. There's a question about language barrier and how much preparation did you invest in language learning before deployment? That's a really one of the critical elements of success is your ability to communicate. Um, not necessarily to read documents in Japanese. Um, that's wonderful if you can do that. And uh, we want those of you who already have strong Japanese to consider applying. But um, it's really, really important at every stage uh, in the application phase to demonstrate your commitment uh, by starting to work on Japanese. I think that separates the wheat from the chaff in terms of those who really want this program. There are people who've started learning Japanese already in one way or another. Um, and then once you're preparing, once you're selected uh, as a fellow in preparing, we do provide pre-departure Japanese language preparation and working hard at that uh, ensures that you'll hit the ground running and then once you're in your placements, you know, working on it and continuing to study and improve uh, to strengthen your ability to communicate in Japanese and to understand with that basis what the Japanese approach to the issues they're working on is. 
I think is, is absolutely critical. I'd, I'd love to hear um, Sarah and Mike on that. I think they're both at kind of ends of the spectrum. Mike with really fluent, amazing Japanese uh, before uh, even applying. Sarah coming in with uh, basically no prior Japanese background or very rudimentary. Both obviously successful fellows were proud to show off. So there's a range. Mm -hmm. um, but Mike, what do you say to that language barrier question? Oh, is Mike all frozen again? Might be frozen. Uh, he looks frozen. I'll, I'll go ahead and answer. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. So, uh, yeah, as Ben said, and as I have mentioned, I, I was pretty much a Japanese language novice. And so I knew that the foundation would probably, or maybe I definitely knew that they would offer some pre-departure language training. But I really wanted to be as good at Japanese as possible when I, when I showed up. So our application timeline was such that I found out that I would be departing in July by the, I think the Thanksgiving before. So that gave, I don't know, seven or eight months. And so what I committed to in the interview and on paper and to myself was that I would not only participate in the pre-departure language training, but that I set a certain goal for myself and that I, um, I spent some of my own resources to get a Japanese tutor so that when I got to Japan, I was through like the first Genki textbook, I think is what I did. So, you know, that allowed me, they, when you get to Kanazawa, they split you into viability. And, you know, my goal was to not be in the super beginner class. And, you know, I, I was able to achieve that goal. And then once I was in Japan, I also wanted to keep studying intensely so, you know, I set a goal that by the time I left Japan, I wanted to pass the JLPT and four level, which is what I ended up doing. So it was really good to not just be like, oh, I'm going to do Duolingo when I have free time. Because, I mean, if you've ever studied languages, you know, that's not the way to learn a language. Um, I think setting a certain criteria for yourself or, you know, being able to sign up for a community college beginner Japanese class if you're a beginner would be really key. I, yeah, I apologize. My internet is kind of flaky. I've got two high schoolers, I think, that are beating the internet pretty hard with <laughs> school. But, um, you know, the pre-departure language training, I, I would highly recommend that you, you do that. I, I, I'll also say, I don't care how good your Japanese is. Uh, when you go into an office place that you're totally unfamiliar with, it'll be a struggle. <laughs> So I, we have people who are really good at Japanese who go into the language or who go into the office places. And, uh, you know, there's just office lingo that are, that's, a, that's a challenge. So the more you do in advance, I think the better off you're going to be. But having said that, um, you know, it should not be intimidating. And I think, you know, Sarah's a great example of a number of different fellows that I know who've gone through the, the program that uh, have started out with, with little to no Japanese. Um, my level was sort of in the middle. Um, and, and I felt like um, it is a struggle at times, but you do your best and uh, you find that everyone is very accommodating. And if you can speak a little bit, it goes a long way. Um, but there'll be plenty of opportunities to, to learn and develop throughout the course of your, your time there, as well as in advance of going. And I found that the time that I spent uh, pre-departure in particular was particularly valuable for me. Thank you. We have just one pre-submitted question that I wanted to make sure I know we're right over time, but this will be the last question. Um, just asking about workloads while you're in Japan and if you worked a 40 hour week or um, what that looked like. You want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, legend about the Japanese working till all hours of the night and whatnot. And, and you would see that, you know, I, I mean, there was a guy in my office who always took the first train in the morning and the last train at night, but that, that's not really the expectation, nor is it the norm that I found in my situation. Uh, people were a little bit more relaxed about that, but you, you know, you're working a lot. I mean, I found myself quite frankly uh, working a lot because I was trying to record my you know, I was keeping a journal every day. I was providing monthly reports. I was trying to take as much, you know, soak it all in. And 
I, I probably did not take as much advantage of just uh, you know the birds and the flowers as I should have while I was there. And Ben will encourage you to do that. I'd spent a lot of time in Japan over the course of my my life, and so I, I wasn't as concerned about that. But I did feel like the overall workload uh, is manageable. But um, you can kind of make it a little too all-consuming if you really are trying to do all those things too. So. I don't think that the job or the expectation that your placements have or place on you is going to be all that uh, too much or burdensome, but um, but you you can always stay and take the last train if you really want to. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, it's definitely a full workload, and I'm I'm sure they have mentioned in other informational materials you can't you can't keep doing your job back home. Like you can't, it's, it's a thousand percent against the rules. So focus, being able to focus on what you're doing in Japan is, is really important. And there, there are a lot of um, Japanese bureaucrats that do stay very late. And, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're feeling the work vibe of staying late, you know, sometimes I did that, but you know, usually I didn't. So um, it's, it's great to experience both pieces of that puzzle, you know, also depending on your, your personal commitments, you know, you shouldn't have to feel obligated to stay late. Um, but they do work really hard. I think Japanese bureaucrats have almost like a more kind of militaristic view of, of being a bureaucrat. They take a lot of pride in it. It's so it kind of aligns a lot with this like duty on our country mindset. Um, so they do have a lot of pride in their professionalism. And it's, it's really nice to be around and might inspire you to work late sometimes. But it should definitely inspire you to, to participate in the, the nomikais, the, the social events related to work. Let me just say that uh, Mike mentioned, I'll encourage you to enjoy all Japan has to offer. And, you know, um, we, we try and send the message that our fellows should model work-life balance and that this is something that we're helping the Japanese understand is that it, you're dedicated to your jobs, but you're also, you know, you have a life outside your office and you have a family and that those are important to you and that's okay. Um, so that's one message that I always share with our, our fellows before they go is that don't feel too much like you need to mimic uh, how the Japanese approach their work. You're not them, and you never could be. At the same time, the dedication uh, should be clear. Even if it's not in hours, um, you should really show uh, that you're there as a serious member of their team, and you're not just passing through, floating blithely by while they work hard. That's not going to establish your credibility. It's not going to show... Uh, the best aspects of the foundation or the US government, if you're too um, free to be, you know, okay, well, thanks all, have a good night working, I'm heading home um, every single time. So again, while modeling work-life balance, we also expect you to really show some form, in some way, some dedication to the mission and the task. It's a, it's a difficult balance to strike. And you'll have to adjust that and consult as needed. But um, it, it's a wonderful opportunity. And you should be excited about the prospects, whichever way you, know, you shift that balance. Uh, it's an amazing program. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Alexis. This has been a, a really helpful session. Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo that. I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you to everyone who attended today. If we didn't get the chance to answer your question, I apologize. Um, please feel free to email me. Um, again, my email is on the website and I put it in the chat. It's aros at mansfieldfdn.org. Um, thank you again, everyone, so much. We look forward to reading your applications. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone.